Greetings and thank you for joining us at FutureMoneyTrends.com. Our guest today made big news earlier this month in the precious metals markets. He's one of the most important people we've ever had on our show, not just because he's made myself and our subscribers a small fortune with his silver company in the past six, seven, eight years, but he's also one of the most important guys in the mining industry because he's the one fighting back against the massive shorting and price suppression in the precious metals arena. Uh, with a direct attack a few weeks ago in an open letter to the CFTC that went viral on Zero Hedge and dozens of other media publications, Keith Newmeyer is the CEO of First Majestic Silver and chairman of First Mining Finance, a new resource acquisition company that he recently launched along with early investors like Eric Sprott, Rick Rule, Marin Katusa, Doug Casey, uh, this is going to be one of the most important shows, if not the most important show of the year, because we're going to get an inside look at silver price suppression coming from one of the largest primary silver producing CEOs in the world. He's agreed to also give us an exclusive look on what could potentially be his third billion dollar company. Keith Newmeyer, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks, Daniel, and uh, thanks for that introduction. Keith, uh, you made big news earlier this month uh, with the letter to the CFTC. Uh, first of all, what caused you to write such a letter and and put it out there in the public space? And then has there been any response from the U.S. regulators? Well, I guess it comes down to frustration more than anything. Um, you know, I've been watching this market, and it's not silver, just silver. It's hard. I think it's... I think you know, 20 years ago, I think there was probably very few markets that were, that were manipulated. Now it just seems that every market is manipulated. And, and I'm a little bit cautious with that word because I think what we would have called manipulated 20 years ago is just normal course trading today. And I think mean, that's why the regulators just kind of look away because they just see what goes on on a daily basis and they just call it normality. So no one throws that word out because it's just normal practices. So it's a little bit of a frustrating situation. I run a, um, you know, one of the largest pure silver companies in the world and, and, and uh, second largest silver producer in Mexico. And, you know, when the price gets pulled out from you the way it has uh, over the last, you know, three or four years, it really makes our business uh, challenging. And uh, we've had many shareholders come to me through, you know, and, and uh, at the different conferences I go to and, you know, via telephone and so on, you know, asking us to do something. And, and uh, so obviously Ted Butler and, and uh, others out there are, you know, big, big, uh, you know, advocates or, or, you know, big spokespeople for the silver market. And I decided it was about time for us to come out and say something. And uh, that's what I did. And I know there hasn't been any response from the CFTC and no response from any other CEOs in the uh, uh, silver or gold business. Keith, does the does the um, obvious manipulation that you pointed out, and I like that your letter was short and brief to the point. Um, you 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 cited a few dates or a date where it was obvious, and just put it out there for them to to review. And I want to know: Does the physical silver suppression also extend to the mining shares? Well, I think it does um, um, because I think it's the same trade. You know, the, 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 um, you know, if you watch the way the mining stocks trade, uh, you, you know, you can almost predict what the metal is going to do the next day. And it's a trend that I've noticed several times over the last 10 years. And, you know, one day, you know, gold and silver could be flat. And all of a sudden, the mining equities are getting slammed. And, and you know, they're down four or five or whatever percentage points. And then the next day, the metal prices are down. And I've seen it happen the other way, where the metals are getting hit and the equities are, are maintaining their price, and the next thing you know, the equities get hit. So I think it's the same traders on both sides of the market. Why, why do you suspect the regulators would allow such an obvious market manipulation, and specifically in the silver market? Well, I, you know, you say obvious, it's obvious to you and I. You know, we're on the outside, and, 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 and this has been going on for multi, you know, years, and then I think it should become the normal way of trading, and uh, I'm not sure if you know what the, the term spoofing means, but, uh, 
you know, I used to be a trader, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, I guess I'm a little bit more passionate than other CEOs in the mining sector. I, I worked for three of the Canadian national banks in the 80s, and uh, my, my job was arbitraging equities uh, over, you know, several different markets in my, Montreal, Toronto, NASDAQ, and the um, Vancouver Stock Exchange. So, you know, I, I know a lot about trading, and, and uh, you know, spoofing, we didn't even know, we didn't have a word for it back then, but it was a method of trading where you would put in a big bid or a big offer to try to fool the market to generate either buying or selling, and you would take advantage of, of that by, by, by you know, doing the opposite of what you're trying to tell the market you're doing. And, uh, you know, over time, you know, back then it was a relatively innocent, you know, form of trading because, you know, you didn't have computers back then. Nowadays, you know, you can put in, you know, multi-million shares or multi-million ounces of buying or selling uh, and, and, and basically put a bid in or an offer in the market and you move the market up without executing any trades at all. And it's called spoofing. So you fool the market in thinking there's a huge buyer, a huge seller in the market and all these other buyers or sellers start front running this huge uh, bid or offer. And then all of a sudden, just before, seconds before, that trade actually um, executes, the computer automatically pulls it. So you see these huge spikes uh, up and down as, and the spoofing mechanism or, 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 or trade is making a lot of the big players in this market a lot of money. And the regulars just sit by and just watch it happen. They know it happens, but they, they, but they you know, just sit on their you know, uh, their desks and where they're sitting and, and, and do nothing about it. Keith, is, is one of the things that makes you upset, is it disproportional? You had mentioned that all, all the markets are manipulated, and, and our friend, mutual friend Chris Pallet said there are no markets. There's only manipulations now. So it's talking about stocks or oil or what, whatever commodity. But it is one of the things that makes you upset – is it disproportional where, okay, there's manipulation in the Dow and the Fed comes out and says rates are going up or down and the Dow will go up 300 points or down, but is is it more direct and more uh, engaged uh, in the silver and gold markets? Yeah, it's really hard to say. You know, it's, it's, uh, you know, my business is mining. I've been in the mining sector for 31 years now and it's a sector I've got a lot of passion for and a sector that I believe in a lot and then a uh, very critical sector to all the other sectors, you know, the, the high tech sector, the automotive sector, all the, all the other sectors that we rely on as a human race would not exist without the mining sector. So, you know, I think it's the most important sector of all businesses and um, it often gets ignored. So, but it is a very small business. And, you know, when you look at, you know, the market cap of Apple, you know, you could sit pretty well every single mining company on the planet into Apple's market cap. So it gives you kind of a perspective on even though mining is very important, it is quite a tiny business. So any tiny market is more easily manipulated than, you know, a much larger market. Uh, Keith, uh, when you speak with guys like Eric Sprott, who manages a silver physical fund, or other silver producing CEOs, what percentage would you speculate that have the same opinion as yourself? Um, is this common knowledge amongst silver mining CEOs or or executives or people who are dealing in the precious metals community? Well, you know, I think, you know, when when we're you know, at the conferences and when we're close and, and chatting and, you know, we, we obviously do talk about these things, but uh, it does surprise me a little bit that uh, there are not more vocal CEOs out there. And I think, you know, my history, you know, with, you know, being, being from the finance side of the business and, and many of the other CEOs being, you know, from, you know, accounting or, or, or legal or, or engineering or, or geology, you know, they, they tend to have slightly different focuses. And I think, you know, that's probably why um, you don't see them being as vocal as I am. Keith, I want to get into the supply of uh, and demand fundamentals for silver, but before I do, uh, I'm really excited to bring to the attention of my subscribers uh, a new opportunity. I mean, you had, uh, you've had you had a long history in, in the resource sector, uh, taking first quantum minerals from penny stock to billion-dollar giant, 
Uh, then First Majestic Silver, uh, which I was lucky enough to to start investing in in the in the mid two thousands, late two thousands, um, where it went for, again from penny stock to billion dollar market cap in twenty eleven. And now you've launched First Mining Finance uh, with some early investors with big names, Eric Sprott, Rick Rule, Doug Casey, Marin Katusa. And you started off with 18 projects, gold, silver, copper, lead, zinc. I mean, all, all, on one day, all on day one. And now you guys just announced a gold acquisition. Can you introduce the audience to First Mining Finance? Yeah, one thing that uh, your, your listeners should be aware of is in both, both cases, in First Continent and First Majestic, I acquired assets to both of those companies when they were cheap. No, no one wanted them. You know, they despite producing mines that First Majestic currently is operating. And don't forget, First Majestic is the second largest silver producer in Mexico. So that's a, you know, it's a significant achievement. Four of those mines were, were purchased from January 2004 to June of 2006, over an 18-month time frame, where no one wanted them. Uh, I bought them for pennies on the dollar. The guy combined the four mines cost me less than ten million dollars. You know, shocking um, uh, amount of money. Actually, it was um, around ten million dollars. I had to go back and do the calculations specifically, but it's around that number. So four mines, you know, for for that amount of money. I'm looking at the market today, where you know we're we're seeing just absolutely ridiculous valuations. And I decided to put together another company. And uh, we're the first acquisition, you know, uh, Coastal Gold, um, very, very interesting uh, project. Uh, it's going to be a, a big gold mine in the future. And as you said already, we've got 18 projects coming out of the gate. So Coastal will be our 19th project. We're looking at another dozen other companies we're, we're, we're looking to acquire over the next 12 to 24 months. And, uh, Shareholders will be pleased with some of the things that we're doing there. And uh, you're right, I'm, I'm, my focus is to build another billion dollar company. I'm not doing this just to, you know, have some fun and games. Uh, I'm very serious about the company. I'm, I'm the chairman. I put together a very good management team, and we're very focused on uh, building that business. Uh, Keith, I was talking to Marin Katusi the other day, and he told me a thousand dollars is like having twenty thousand dollars in the market five years ago. And if you could just give us an idea of what he's talking about, looking at just some of the assets in First Mining. You know, First Mining is a company, market cap is less than $30 million right now. What are what are some of the, what were some of these assets that you guys have? What would they have been valued at five years ago, Sam? Well, I think that the, you know, forget about the coastal transaction because that's, you know, yeah, by, coast, by, by itself, you know, in normal markets, you know, gold trades, you know, have been trading, you know, between fifteen hundred dollars. You know, uh, I, I, when I say that, I mean for a mining company to go and buy ounces in the ground, uh, that's what a company would generally pay for for ounces in the ground. Now, of course, that it did go higher than that. There were some transactions that went went through at multi hundreds of dollars. But today, uh, ounces are selling for less than ten dollars an ounce in the ground. So you know that kind of valuation is absolutely ridiculous. And uh, so even if if uh, you were to sit, you know, uh, uh, on your hands for the next two or three years, and things went back to normal, to the fifty dollar an ounce range or fifty to hundred dollar an ounce range, which is normal. And all of a sudden, you know, you're making five, ten times your money just by doing basically nothing. So the per- first uh, mining portfolio, in my view, um, the original 18 projects, I think, would have had a market cap of easily 100 or 200 million dollars, and potentially even higher than that, uh, because there's some really good projects uh, in, in our current portfolio. I mean, coastal to that. It's got 1.2 million ounces of gold in the ground. You know, value it what you will, but um, you've got another, you know, multi tens of millions of dollars in valuation there, and then plus the other acquisitions that we'll be doing over the next 12 uh, to 24 months. 
Keith, um, you just mentioned more acquisitions next 12 to 24 months. What about, uh, let's say, three years from now? I mean, what can investors fully expect from uh, first mining finance? Because it is different than first quantum minerals and first majestic silver in the sense that they're more traditional uh, exploration and then you brought them to production. What can we expect as investors in first mining, which trades on the TSX venture under FF? Yeah, I'm saying 12 to 24 months because I'm trying to be conservative. But uh, I, I'm hoping we're going to do it, do things much quicker. I'm on record by saying that I hope to have three major acquisitions done by the end of this year. Um, you know, that's my personal objective. You know, whether I'll be able to pull that off or not, it depends. You know, how things go in the next few months. But you know, that that is very, very much our focus, and we're being very aggressive. You know, with, with that plan in place. But you're right. Uh, first body finance is not first majestic and is not first quantum. You know, both of those companies became producing companies. You know, very large copper company, very large solar company. In this case, we're not going to be a producer. We're not going to be an explorer. We're not going to be a developer. We're simply buying these assets, and then we're going to go look for partners. And uh, in my view, this market is very broken. And as a result of that, the values that we're seeing right now are absolutely ridiculous and I'm, I'm seen in, in my 30 years of being in this business and I want to take advantage of it. I think that um, a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, we'll have partners, uh, major mining companies partnering with these projects and creating value for our shareholders, paying dividends for our shareholders, doing share spin outs, doing royalty structures, doing streaming deals, creating revenue and then paying dividends Uh, Keith, on um, to the metal specifically, because not only are they, they trading at low valuations and the assets are cheap, but there are some supply and demand situations. And now a lot of us are familiar with silver, and I do want to touch on that. But uh, last I, I spoke to Rick Rule, he seemed to be very excited about the supply and balance for zinc. And um, you're obviously an expert on on the on the metals specifically, and and of course with first majestic silver, uh, physical silver. Can you just share with the audience the opportunity in investing in these metals right now or the, or the, the underlying assets that have them uh, of the supply and demand imbalance for silver and then if you could touch on zinc for us? Well, Rick is referring to two major mines that are coming offline this year. And um, there's about 1.2 million tons of zinc concentrate coming offline, which represents about 15% the world market for zinc, and that's a pretty big number um, for just all of a sudden to disappear. What your listeners should be realized is both of those mines produce silver as well. So there's a lot of silver coming offline. There's about 10 million ounces of silver coming offline this year uh, from those two mines. So um, there, there's a lot of excitement in the zinc space as a result of that. There's a lot of clamoring going on behind the scenes. Uh, at first, the Jets were actually doing some planning, uh, some uh, one- and two-year planning to bring some, uh, uh, some of our zinc oil bodies, which we've ignored in the past uh, you know, because we've been very much focused on on, um, on silver. Uh, but you know, due to the supply of demand fundamentals for zinc over the next uh, couple of years, we're expecting to see you know 50% increase in zinc prices over the next couple of years, and I think it makes sense for us to have a plan in place to bring zinc online. We're, we're already producing zinc already, but um, we'd like to increase that over the next couple of years. But you know, it just goes to this whole um, you know, metal sector, and that's why I think First Mining is such an important company, because you know there's a complete disconnect. You know, People are paying attention to the Alibabas or the Apples or the the next, you know, biotech IPO and all these guys, all these institutions or, you know, investors are making a lot of money in that sector. It's great that they're doing that. I don't have any problem with people making money, but at the same time, they're completely ignoring this, the, the resource sector. And the supply and demand for metals for silver are just absolutely amazing. And, and gold and zinc and copper. And, uh, you know, in first mining, we're not one metal specific. We're buying good quality assets of all metals, the jurisdiction is really important to us. And that's really ultimately our primary
regulatory criteria of permittability and jurisdiction. And that will come second. Keith, what do you think ultimately the, uh, I mean, this is totally speculative, of course, because no one can predict the marketplace, but what do you think the free market price of silver is if we didn't have this massive concentrations of short positions? Um, what's your best guess? I mean, what do you think silver is really truly worth uh, to make the market functionable and new exploration, uh, you know, worth it for companies? Is it $30? Is it 50 Is it 100 you know, I, I would have to go to the ratio, you know, and this is something Eric Spark talks a lot about because, um, and I'm a huge believer of it, it uh, you know, right now, you're mining 10 ounces of silver for every one ounce of gold. So gold is trading at, let's say, $1,200 just to round it up. So that would be $120 silver if the ratio was 10 to 1. So I say silver should be $120. The other key ratio is the ratio that has been common, you know, for 500 years, and that's the, Sir Isaac Newton came up with the ratio of 16 to 1, and that's how they created the pound sterling. And, and um, so there was a theory that there was, for every one ounce of gold, there's 16 ounces of silver in the Earth's crust. So using 16 to 1, at $1,200, it's the math would probably be somewhere around eighty or ninety dollars an ounce. So it's you know silver should be trading in my view from somewhere from eighty to one hundred twenty dollars an ounce. Well, that's interesting because there's a strong case, as you know, from uh, the the uh, massive evidence GATA, um, uh, the Gold Antitrust Action Committee has uh, shown that gold is has significant price suppression. So perhaps gold should be closer to 2000 and of course that would up the the uh, price of silver as well. Uh, Keith, last time we had you on your sh uh, uh, on the show, um, and this will be the last question, guys. I know I know you're busy and you're you're actually in London right now, taking some time with us. So we really appreciate it. Uh, we had talked about a global reset, and I wanted to just get your opinion. I mean, you just came back from Switzerland. Now you're in London. You're on your way to Mexico. Looking at global finance, um, does it still play out that there's some type of global reset coming for the U.S. dollar and and U.S. debt back system? I, I, well, I, it's in the cards, uh, uh, for sure. Uh, you know, predicting exactly what it's going to mean or, or, or what it's going to look like, that's a big challenge. And uh, I think a lot of people are ignoring it. Now, there, you know, there's some you know, forward thinkers out there that you know, do talk about it and so on. But, um, you know, it's a bit of a guessing game. And, and uh, you, know, you know, some people say, you know, China's going to, to you know, gonna link their, their currency to gold. And I'm not sure if I'm an actual believe that because I think that um, um, you know China probably is very happy in this current environment. You know, they've got rallying US dollar, they're the big holder of US dollars, they're buying gold on the cheap. You know, they, they can go and buy all the mines around the world that they're doing. They can buy a bunch of hard assets uh, around the gold which they're doing with with expensive US dollars and, and cheap commodities and you know like low oil prices. You know, China is having a great old time right now with with, with um, you know the amount of U.S. dollars there they currently have and the amount of U.S. dollars that are coming into their country. So I think um, they're probably the last group that really wants to change things. So, um, but I do think that um, the Chinese want their their currency part of a floating currency and that and then part of the SDR. So I think that's really going to be the next. Link in this whole uh, change or reset going going forward, and it, it could even happen this year. Uh, there's a major meeting happening uh, later this year with the IMF, and uh, there's a lot of speculation that uh, the Chinese will have the yen uh, uh, linked or, or or part of the SDRs, which will be a big thing for the Chinese. You know that that will allow them to start trading our currency internationally. Um, um, uh, the Americans are currently opposed to it, as you probably know. Um, you know they see the threat, um, but um, you know, I think it will happen. I think it's going to be difficult for um, the IMF to prevent the end from going into the SDR. And after that, we'll probably go into uh, uh, another period of, of, of stability. And then I think maybe down the road, we'll see uh, commodities or gold then start being part of uh, the international financial uh, system. 
Do you think it's uh, possible that if uh, China uh, discloses their gold holdings, that we could could that could that spark the next big bull run in gold? Well, of course it would, <clears throat> and that's what I'm. I'm just going back to what I was saying earlier. I don't know if China is ready for that to happen um, because once they do it, you know, gold will probably go up by some multi. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars. I could see gold going up to three thousand dollars, or you know, some number like that. Who knows exactly what number it would be? But but I could easily see that that would occur because all of a sudden people will see you know the the, the hoard that the Chinese have actually accumulated over the last decade. I think that would completely change the market. But I'm not quite sure whether the Chinese actually want that to happen. I think ultimately they do. But I think they're quite happy just selling U.S. dollars and buying gold right now, and they're likely going to do that for the, for the foreseeable future when when gold runs out and uh, they just simply can't buy anymore. Keith Newmeyer of First Majestic Silver and Chairman of First Mining Finance, uh, trading on the TSXV under FF. Keith, thank you so much for your time again. We really appreciate it. Well, thanks, Daniel. I enjoyed sharing the conversation.